Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to be seeing a great crowd. Uh, lots of uh, people that are born in the aughts, I think. Is that like the new, the new thing? Uh, I'm born a few, few, de a few decades before the aughts. So. Uh, anybody born in the 30s here? Uh, nobody in the 30s. How about the 40s? How many people born in the 40s? Yeah, okay, a few people. I, I can handle that. And, so, and uh, how about 50s? People born in the 50s? 60s. Anybody born in the great 60s? Oh, a lot of 60s. 70s. How about people born? Oh, all right. Uh, 80s? Not a lot of activity in the 80s. It must have been the sex drive was down among the parents. What was happening in the 80s? How about the 90s? Okay, a couple 90s. And how about in the aughts? All right. All right. And uh, anybody born in the last five or six years? <laughs> The baby's here this morning, all right, well, good. Uh, so uh, we're going to be getting some photos and videos, so if anybody does not want to do video or photo, uh, she let, 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 well, uh, Lauren, right? Laura, Laura, no. And she's with the, why don't you come out and say what you're with, because we're, we're promoting new businesses, and Laura's going on a new, new venture here. So. Thank you. Hi, guys. We're actually launching. Say your name. My name is Laura Cowan. I'm with Chronicle Press. Um, it is a new tech blog as well. Right? Everybody's got to be in the spotlight. We're All right, I'm not used to, I'm used to being on the side. Um, we're a new tech blog in town that is basically people focused and interested in helping people foster more community and networking, particularly in technology because it's a growing industry that could use some more media coverage and some more community locally. But every business is increasingly a tech integrated business. So we're also looking at arts, music, wellness, psychology, everything, you name it. So um, we are here at the invitation of Rob today, and today's actually our launch with our first one there. So, uh, uh, if you would not like the picture published, just please come see me, and I will be happy to exclude you from the picture. So thank you very much. How about those that really want their picture published? No, they come see you too. Uh, and it's pretty brave of you to go into this to new media business because oh. it's, it's been a tough, tough haul for them. But everything's moving, the, everything's moving to the internet, right? So, and you should talk to Peter because your business sounds a lot like what Peter's Actually, Peter and I are how I know. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. so that's just not yeah. a coincidence. Thanks, everybody right? knows everything. All right, happy, happy to meet you. And also our, uh, our astute uh, and uh, excellent videographer is Roger Rail, and he's one of the, the sponsors of this event. Roger does lots of media stuff, and particularly video, and so many of these events, probably uh, two-thirds of them, are on my website and on a YouTube channel. Uh, which is about Leavers Connect, and you can look up Rob Pasek, and we have many of these events going back, and including uh, basically any famous person that you might think of in Ann Arbor or outside of it. So anybody who's been on E or on uh, you know, the Academy Awards is probably also on my YouTube channel. Uh, so let's I'll just introduce the other uh, sponsors, because this event is, is free to the community, and uh, it's able to happen because of the sponsors. So uh, we've got Bank of Ann Arbor, and so where is it? What, come on up. So Bank of Ann Arbor person, and Raymond person. So come on up, and, uh, and you can come on up. Yeah. All right, so uh, we do our first new sponsor, and uh, Andrea is going to explain who that is. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrea. Um, I come from Office Evolution Ann Arbor. We're uh, one of the new sponsors, uh, and we feel very lucky to get a chance to sponsor an event like Leaders Connect. I'll tell you just a little bit about us, but very briefly. Uh, we are a professional business center with 26 private offices and co-working space. And we are in the business of providing solutions to common growing pains that entrepreneurs and small businesses might encounter in the growth process. So let's say you're an entrepreneur and you own your business from your house. Eventually you're going to need a business out of us. Uh, we have a business out of us for you to use. Eventually you might need a private office. We have 26 of them. Uh, we're brand new to the state of Michigan. Uh, we have over 80 locations nationwide. And because of that, um, me and the owner of Office Evolution like to attend as many networking events as possible to get the word out. And so this is my invitation to you all. Um, call me up. I encourage you to get a tour of our space. Um, if you don't know anybody, or if you're not an entrepreneur yourself, you might know somebody. And if you'd like to try one of our offices for free, no strings attached, uh, for a day, for a few days, give me a call. I have business cards on the table in the other room. And once again, my name is Andrea, and I'm from Office Evolution in Harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
got uh, yeah, one of the best spots in town, too, right on the corner of uh, East Eisenhower and State Street. So as long as there's no road construction, it's great. And you get, when you walk in, you get to see, you get to meet Andrea, right? She's right in the front. So and, and you also do, like, office services for people, too, that they need it. So it's a pretty cool solution to uh, the, the problems of workspace right now. So thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, let's see, Bank of Ann Arbor. Come on up there. You want to talk about what you guys are up to? Sure. Um, so thank you everybody for coming out today. Yes, please introduce yourself. Yep, Michael McCarthy with Bank Van Arbor. I'm in the Trust and Investment Management Group within the bank. We obviously have banking, lending, as well as corporate 401k management. Um, so we're honored to be in the community and have people like Rob, uh, companies like Raymond and Office Evolution um, come together and put on events like this. Wouldn't have them without all of you here, so thank you. What, do you, do you have the, uh, any announcements yet about this summer uh, series? Or? Uh, not yet, yeah. so yeah. stay posted. Uh, can I put in a request? Or, yeah. <laughs> I just I don't know how much I can I've do. seen a lot of rock stars, but I've never seen Elton John, so if you can get Elton. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Joe Cocker, I don't think, and uh, Joni Mitchell. So okay. uh, this is three of them, and it's going to be fine. Right? I'll put it over for you. Okay, great. Thanks, man. <laughs> and uh, Lynn? Good morning, everyone. I'm Linda Late. I work at Raymond. We're a full-service accounting and consulting firm. So if you have any business needs, we're there to help solve them. Um, big, busy tax season for us right now. We're finishing up, but we also can help out with your QuickBooks and your IT consulting, cybersecurity, and uh, cloud IT systems. So any of that we can help with. And thank you for joining us this morning. We really appreciate all of your attendance and working with all of you. Great, great to you. Thanks, Lynn. So you're, you're, you're uh, proving Laurel's point that uh, everything is checked at this point. You, CPAs are going to check. Right? They are. Everything okay. is checked. Okay, great. Great. Well, hey, 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 anybody here from uh, North Star Reach? I guess that's, so that's our other, it's kind of a sponsor, but it's also what we're sponsoring. North Star Reach is a camp for children who are uh, they have chronic, uh, severe med medical problems. And so we don't uh, charge for this, but if people want to, uh, write a check to support uh, a good a, a good enterprise, a nonprofit. North Star Reach is, is, is one. And uh, next month, actually, Leaders Connect is going to be focused on the nonprofit sector. So Doug uh, Armstrong, who's the CEO and uh, founder of North Star Reach, will be one of the speakers. We also have uh, the founder of uh, uh, the uh, food uh, food gatherers, which would be really interesting. Is anybody else part of this that's going to be here next month? I, I forget. Uh, but we have four or five of the leaders uh, in the nonprofit world. We're going to talk about the, the challenges and stresses of uh, being a leader in the nonprofit world and how that compares to being a leader in the for profit world. So let's see. If I got everybody, Beth, I'm going to ask Beth to be my, my reminder to get touch cover everything. Uh, we have a lot of other events coming up. We've got Ari, uh, who is going to be speaking in June. Uh, Ari is uh, the founder and uh, one of the, uh, I guess, leaders, well, obviously, leader in the community, a leader of the food worldwide. And he's going to be speaking about it go that he's doing. So it's all very exciting. And I just want to make one more plug, and that is uh, Lauren and I are going to be on uh, Channel 7 this Sunday, doing, uh, talking about uh, teens and both this book and the process of it. So if any of you are tuning in between the Masters and whatever else you're watching this weekend to, uh, to Channel 7 News, we will be on that for, for a sequence. So I'm going to uh, launch right into the program uh, this morning. We've got lots of speakers and people are, are in a hurry to get to what we're talking about. So I'm going to start out, let me just introduce everybody. And uh, this is Karen of uh, Arizona. And I've known Karen uh, and Sylvia Van Burton uh, since they were about 13, 14 years old. I think, and, uh, from the, uh, the Y camp, uh, where my son and they went to uh, the camp and had lots of fun and got into lots of good, good. I won't say all the things you got into, but it was fun. And uh, now Karen and Sylvia are both uh, professional counselors uh, and in private practice, and they're going to be talking about. Uh, some of their work with uh, with this age group and give us some tips about uh, helping uh, people make a successful transition. And then Peter, uh, who's on the end, uh, how do you say your last name? Michaelitis? Is that Michael Michaelides? Michael Michael okay. 
uh, is uh, one of my students at the University of Michigan. I put one other student here today to uh, see if she comes. And uh, Peter is uh, not only a student, but he's an entrepreneur. He's had several businesses already at age, are you 21 yet? Or? 22. 22, okay. So how many businesses? Uh, two successful ones. Two, well, we're not going to know about the nine. Yeah. The entrepreneurs are not know about the whole, uh, the whole deal. How many of you start? Four, okay, so you're batting 500, that's not bad. Yeah. Uh, and I think the first one was a, a parking service for the football games, right? right. All right, you know, I, you know and his dad had a store on Main Street, his dad's lucky, right? Yeah, so some of you may know that from, from that shop. And uh, now I'm gonna to start to speak right now to uh, Lauren and Ali, and uh, we could have a little discussion about how this project got started and uh, what some of their thoughts are about having gone through the uh, college application. Because both of them are, well, I guess Al, you haven't quite made your decision yet, but if, uh, if you have uh, been accepted a couple places. And Lauren, you've been accepted a couple places and have made your decision. Because unless somebody comes up with a great offer, right? Yeah. So I'm going to sit down and talk to you guys. All right, so uh, you gotta let, let you just describe from, from your own perspectives uh, what, what this process was for you, how you got into it, and uh, just maybe where, where you are, what, what you're doing at this point. So just give a, you know, what, who are you, where, where you go to school, and where are you going to school? You're not graduating. <laughs> and then also, you know, what's your impressions of how you got to write the book? All right, so hi, my name is Lauren Humphreys. Um, so essentially, I go to Saline High School, and yeah. <laughs> and my I'm there from Saline, they got to turn off the Okay, so my junior year of high school, I started taking a class called Learning to Breathe, and it was basically my first um, dose of emotional intelligence and what it means to me. So from that class, I basically went into the internship with Rob, having a little bit of knowledge. And as we started, the book basically got started. And I was personally very nervous about the college application process. I knew that I wanted to go to college and I didn't really know where. So I think that that was a great place for me to start. As we learned more and more, I felt that in comparison to my friends who are also applying to college, I felt a lot less stressed out than them throughout the entire process. Maybe not the selection process, but definitely the application process. I was really confident in my answers and I definitely credit that to the emotional intelligence that I've learned from the process of writing the book. Hi, my name's Ali. I go to Pioneer. Yay! Ali <laughs> uh, uh, Actually, I've known Ali since before his birth, right? <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I worked with his mom yeah. and uh, when Al was pregnant, uh, we, were, we were working together. Yeah, so you guys actually shared an office together for yeah, quite a while. Yeah. yeah. So I met Rob through my mom. Actually, I I reached out to my mom in June and I told her, hey, I wanna I wanna do something productive over the summer. I don't wanna pick up golf balls at Lake Forest or Georgetown or or a standard cashier job. So I told her to reach out to her friends and she introduced me to Rob. And from there, I think I just immediately started working with him and I enjoyed all the work that we did and. Soon enough, he asked me to uh, go on this project with him to write eyewear, so uh, I was very excited to do that. How did you guys come up with the eyewear title? I forget who suggested that. What, what was that? How did that come about? <laughs> I think it was Beth, so yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give that to her. Beth, you want to just wave your head? Beth, I mean, so I'll talk because it's basically Beth. <laughs> Um, basically, we're kind of like the I everything generation. I think we kind of accredited it to iPhone as well as everything's about us. Like, I want this, I want that. So I think Rob's book, Self-Aware, we just kind of changed it because we're the I generation. <laughs> Could you talk about your process of uh, what you went through now and to get to the selection of the school that you're, you're in now? And maybe you can talk about what you've gone through in the last few months. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, so I think that college, thinking about college for me, definitely started freshman year as it is for a lot of students. And I think freshman year, I kind of had an altered perspective of what I do now. I kind of thought, oh, you apply to a bunch of schools and the top one, the 
most selective one that you get in. That's just the school that you go to. And I thought it was going to be so easy. And then I applied to a bunch of schools. And I got into a lot of schools. And I was like, it's not this easy. So I think that I really took college as a perspective of not necessarily the most selective school, but the school that you feel like you can thrive most at and what you can do, um, what you can really get out there and do the most at. So you may have gotten to a completely selective school, but that might, might not be the right place for you. And for me, it wasn't. So um, I think that my college process changed from writing the book, but I definitely think that the place that I chose to go is the right place. Did you say where that is? Oh, I'm going to the University of Kentucky. And I definitely, um, I struggled for a few months making this decision, but ultimately I did choose this school because um, I think it is a little bit less selective and I think that I can thrive more and have more opportunities. It wasn't because it was the top of your bracket for the uh, <laughs> And uh, so you're, you're going to go to Kentucky. Yeah. And um, Ali, how about you? Can you talk about your process? Yeah. So like Lauren, I uh, started about freshman year. I really started thinking about college and what I wanted to do. But it wasn't really until last year and junior year where I started solidifying my interests, um, which I ultimately decided to go into to try to major in business, which things end up changing along the way, but that's the thing I have to any right now. Uh, so I, I heard from, like, I, I don't have a, I'm a first generation immigrant, so my parent, my mom didn't really know about much about the college process, so everything was new to me. But uh, I heard that you don't want to try to apply to too many schools as your message that you read in your essays which will eventually fade away. So I stayed selected in the schools that I applied to. I did apply to two dream schools. Uh, two target schools and then two, um, two safe schools. Um, I was accepted into four out of, or three out of the six. Um, and I just, I'm most likely will be attending to be a U of M, but when it's my decision making was uh, my strengths and weaknesses, where I, where I thought I would thrive, but additionally, I, I, try, I don't wanna leave home so much, so I decided that U of M would be a good fit. And also, I, I mainly looked at the school's resources and what they offered to me. Uh, and I knew I wanted to attend a large school rather than a small school. Um, coming from Pioneer, it's a big environment, so I, I didn't really want to go to a small environment. I wanted to have a lot of people close to me so I could network and talk to them. So that's mostly what went into my decision. Ali, uh, you're also an athlete, and I know you've got an offer for an athletic scholarship. Can you talk about how that plays? Because I think a lot of young people uh, are in that dilemma, you know, do they go for the sport or not? So, uh, I also had the opportunity to play soccer at Case Western Reserve University, which is a, a school in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, mostly a medical school, but I was mostly interested in them for the soccer scholarship. Uh, I decided to, to stay away from that, mostly just because I realized that my educational abilities outweigh my athletic abilities and that eventually soccer will eventually dissipate and I'll be left with my knowledge. Um, if I was asked would I rather be Steve Jobs or LeBron James, I'd say Steve Jobs in a heartbeat because LeBron James' athleticism is going to dissipate. So we're going to be left with that knowledge. So that's what went into my decision making. I also want to introduce uh, Peter again. And, uh, Peter is like four years beyond you guys from Ann Arbor. And uh, Peter, maybe you can talk about the transition and why you'd rather be Le LeBron James. So. <laughs> yeah, I would uh, definitely rather be LeBron James. Uh, but uh, LeBron James also has some very good business yeah, yeah. ventures going for himself, besides the athleticism. Um, but yeah, my name is Peter Michaelides, born and raised in Ann Arbor. Uh, I went to Green Hills. Um, Anyone to Green Hills? No. <laughs> um, you went to Green Hills? I saw that. Oh, perfect. Um, and then I went to Michigan, and I studied politics, philosophy, and economics there. Uh, I'm wrapping up my four years uh, here in May, and I'm very glad in the decision to go there. Uh, I was accepted to schools out of outside of Michigan, but um, attending U of M was was different than from what I was told. You know, I was told, oh, you're from Ann Arbor, you probably shouldn't go to U of M, because it's gonna be the same thing. But it was a totally different side of the town. Um, living downtown gave a whole new perspective, meeting new people, um, 
So if anyone's concerned about that, don't be. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to have a lot of opportunities there, uh, from being in the residential college to boxing for Michigan, and also having the opportunity to be in the entrepreneurial community. Uh, and I'd say that the biggest thing that I learned through my four years uh, at Michigan is that you don't know where you're gonna end up. Um, I thought I wanted to go into a business major at the beginning and then I transitioned away from that into the residential college to focus on language and writing. And then I decided that I wanted to participate in a sport, so I picked up boxing. And then I always shied away from Greek life, but then I was given the opportunity to start a fraternity, so I did that. So there's a lot of things that are gonna come up in your four years, and um, my one piece of advice is to not shy away from those experiences, jump on them, uh, and know that this is your time to explore. And don't feel like you have to be stuck in one track, because there's a lot out there and they're all worth this part. You, you also talk about what you're doing today and a little bit about your business. I mean, even today, today you got a cool thing. Yeah, you're doing so school. I apologize. You the business school? Yeah. yeah, I have to leave right after 8 o'clock. Um, I started, my latest company is called Terms and Conditions, and we're forming a creative, collaborative community um, to give a platform to rising artists and creative minds. So there's a lot of people out there who don't view themselves as artists or creative people. But secretly, they're all very talented. So we're trying to give them a platform to express themselves and share their work. And uh, we started with apparel because so it's- You wanna do a little modeling for us? Oh yeah, I have uh, one of our t-shirts on right now. Um, and we started with apparel because it's very easy to distribute on a college campus. But we will be expanding into film and music and more of the visual arts uh, as the company expands. But today I have to run to Ross because there's the Michigan Fashion Media Summit. And um, we're one of six startup fashion design groups that made it out of about 500 who applied from all over the nation. Um, and it's hosted by Louis Vuitton, Steve Madden, and Michael Kors. So, um, We'll be heading That's to right. that. We've got Louis Vuitton shoes, Michael Kors jacket, and uh, exactly, yeah, exactly. Well, sort of anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll be I'll be dashing off to that. If you have time later today, it runs from eight thirty to four o'clock. There's panelists um, all day. I think that there are tickets if you want to go see a panelist, but you're more than welcome to walk through Ross and view the pop-up sh shops from the the various uh, companies that are there. Great. Thanks, Peter. And uh, I, I wanted to bring uh, Karen and Sylvia into the conversation too. Maybe you could talk about your journey and kind of what, what you're experiencing now as you're doing counseling uh, with a lot of these age groups. Hi, I'm Karen Lutter Arizona, and uh, it's interesting to hear about uh, these journeys to college because I don't remember thinking about college in ninth grade. I think uh, it was a little bit different. Um, so. My journey to college uh, was also involved with athletics, so I played soccer, and so that was part of uh, my consideration. But I actually only ended up playing soccer for one year, so I definitely agree with um, that prioritizing, you know, kind of what you want your focus to be, because I, I realized I couldn't do athletics and uh, do the academics that I wanted to do. Um, so I went to uh, Cornell University. I also had a lot of changes. I thought I was going to be a lawyer, which is very funny now. <laughs> that could not be further from my personality, but that was what I went into college thinking that I was going to do. So uh, I ended up studying uh, political science and women's studies. I actually went back and did some undergrad work in psychology before I went to grad school for psychology. So I definitely took a, a meandering path to, to my career as a psychologist. Uh, I think. It is true that uh, there is a lot of pressure on the college process now, and having worked on uh, five different campuses uh, doing college counseling work, um, I, I definitely see a lot of anxiety and concern around what exactly that path is going to be. So I love the idea of exploring. I think that's really important. Uh, I think the, the approach to figuring out your career path is try stuff. You know, you have to, uh, try a lot of different things to figure out what's going to work for you and what's going to create that, that balance between your interests and your talents. So I always encourage my clients to mess up a lot, make a lot of mistakes, try things that you have no idea if they're going to work, 
And I think that, that process uh, develops, develops a lot of emotional intelligence. I think that's key as well. Uh, but that, that spirit of experimentation and trial and error, I think that can be really powerful for, for this process. I definitely should have gone first because Karen always speaks so brilliantly and then when I follow her, I'm always like, uh, mm, well, mostly what she said. <laughs> but it's nice to have brilliant friends. Well, Rob asked me to talk about kids and adults who kind of march to a different drum. And I, so many of my favorite people didn't have a traditional path. My, I guess it's weird to say myself included, <laughs> since it's my favorite people. <laughs> but I think that in in my journey, I didn't I didn't like school. I went to community high school and the Evergreen State College out in Washington, and I did those two schools because I didn't like school, and so I could get credit for projects that I worked on, so that I could do high school and college in six years total. And I, so that I could be done. And I wouldn't say that I spent my extra time really wisely, but I had a lot of fun. And I learned a lot about what it means to build a life without a path. And that, I think, gave me the courage to start my own business later. And now I, I would, I never want to do anything but do my own projects. And I've made that successful based on building trusting relationships with other professionals. And that, I think, is really hard to do when you're spending a lot of your mental energy feeling anxious about whether you're doing the right thing or not. And I think when we build trust with other professionals, we, that's how our new opportunities come. And that's how our new insights about our own path comes. And for me, I think it's been really powerful to find ways to minimize the worrying about like the bad things that might happen or how good I need to be. Because in truth, the, all the awful things that have happened in my life have been, were things that I never thought to worry about. <laughs> and the things that I did worry about didn't turn out to be worth worrying about because the way they happened were so different. And young people really can't envision adulthood very well. And partly that's because they haven't done it, and it's also partly because as adults, we sort of stop narrating what it feels like on the inside. I don't know about you guys, but I don't wake up feeling like Man, I'm such a real adult. I'm really adulting. <laughs> but I don't go around telling my kids, you know, I didn't, I felt kind of unprepared, so I winged it. And, you know, I was a little bit late, but I acted like it was fine. Or I was really prepared, but then what happened wasn't exactly what I prepared for. I don't really narrate those things, even though they're totally true for adults. And that even though, and I work, I'm a facilitator for YPO, the Young President's Organization, and so I work with a lot of top executives. And the things that they talk about when it's confidential is, is some of the same insecurities that people in high school feel and people in college feel. It's not easy to be a professional, and it's not easy to make decisions all the way through our lives. And I think that's okay. And I think we'd all be a lot happier if we didn't keep those moments or those insecurities a secret. Because when we do finally talk about them, we find that the people we say it to say, oh yeah, me too, back to us. Well, those are some very good words. And I, I was thinking as you were speaking, we're, we're talking about college-bound students. Uh, but I think it's important to remember the other, other people in our society, which is probably the majority of people. And I ran into a woman the other day who was uh, a lawyer, and uh, she was uh, working on a project. I said, what, what are you working on? It, it, she's working on getting uh, resentencing um, hearings for kids who were put into prison for life. And we think about this a lot of people. I think in, in Michigan we have the most of under eight, under like 18 year old kids. 
And how is she doing that? How is she trying to get them re resentenced? Not re retry, but resentenced. And the reason is that the new, new evidence is that our brains are not formed at that age. As a matter of fact, brains are not even formed at your age. That <laughs> fully formed brains, here you can you comment that come much later. So we, we really don't give our youth a chance when we have them raised in environments like South Side Chicago or East Side Detroit uh, or South Side Ypsilanti. And we don't even have them, it's not even on their radar to be thinking about college. So I think it's important when we're talking about this to realize we're coming from a pretty privileged thing and that we're dealing with people, uh, we can make them self-aware, but who they are, they're not even fully self-developed as a, as a biological creature. Carl, maybe you can comment on that. You've studied a bit of this. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in, in kind of using uh, evolution to think about, you know, what, what is, how to live today. And so it, it is true that uh, right now we're thinking that brains don't really develop until age 25. So you can tell all your kids, you can do drugs, but only after you're 25, when your brain is fully developed. <laughs> uh, so uh, also thinking about that um, we are social animals, and so that is an essential piece to our wellness, um, and I think that uh, loneliness is actually a really big problem. And um, thinking about uh, developing the skills for making friends and making connections, and then having that social support uh, is absolutely essential uh, to success in college and in life. Um, and, and knowing that those friendships uh, also build our brains and build those connections, so uh, it's part of our academic performance as well to have that that social piece. Um, so I think thinking about kind of the basics or thinking back to, you know, the way that we're wired, the way we evolved, uh, can be really powerful. Peter, I know you have to leave, and, and I just want to give you one last word, and that is when people look at you, they see this uh, young man who's been extremely uh, successful in many endeavors, and we're talking about insecurities, and I know we've been talking about your your your, uh, your current decision, uh, you know, which you're still in the midst of, is what do you do next? And maybe you can talk about that side of it too. What is it like to have the world see you as a totally secure, together guy and then have that inside part of being un unsure about different things? Yeah, you know, uh, the classic saying, fake it till you make it, right? Um, but for me, with self-awareness, uh, it's definitely been a journey. And I find comfort in the fact that it's a journey because you know, you might get to a position where you're like, oh, I'm set, things are going well, you know, I have friends, I know what I'm focusing on, and then the next day, something changes. And I think that it's important to focus on the journey and enjoy it rather than strive to get to the self-aware position. Um, in my experience, you know, there have been many times where I've thought I've reached self-awareness and that I, I felt that after speaking with mentors and parents and family and friends that I knew exactly what I was gonna do as I was mentioning earlier with college. But then when, once I realized that the journey is part of the process and that I'm currently living my life, it's not, oh, I'm gonna graduate, get a job, start a company and work, it's, you know, my life's going on right now, and as I'm figuring it out, and as I'm on this journey, I'm living. And if you don't pay attention to that, and you don't enjoy that, you're missing a bunch of really, you know, potentially great experiences and opportunities. So... What are some of the things you're weighing? Yeah, so, so with me, it's, you know, my biggest decision right now is, do I go and work for someone else? Um, for a while and gain more experience and learn more about what it's like being in a large organization. Uh, I had the opportunity to work for Domino's uh, last summer and then also work with them in the fall. And that was a totally different experience than working for myself or working in a startup group at the University of Michigan. So I'm weighing that balance of whether I should go work for someone or continue to work for myself. And it seems that it's the more I think about it, the more I'm finding ways to make everything I want to do work. Um, you know, people don't just sit around with extra time in their day where they're like, all right, I'm gonna find something to fill this time. 
everyone's doing stuff all day, so you kind of have to prioritize the things you want to do and adjust for that. So that's the current uh, the current situation I'm in, and um, open to suggestions. If anyone who's been there. <laughs> We've got a couple of the skiing entrepreneurs. How many businesses have you started, Chuck? Chuck Newman there? Lost count. Lost count, okay. <laughs> and uh, you're batting about 502, I think, about like Peter. Yeah? In my best season. In your best season. <laughs> uh, but so that's that's really interesting. And I, I think uh, this whole idea that people have talked about, what's, what's, how did I come up with self-awareness and is that the right title? And I think about my own work and my own self, and I think I should have really called it self-improvement. Because that's kind of what uh, I think we're all working on day to day. And I'm, I've got in the habit of journaling. I have a journal out there that I, I created. And actually, this journal has got me thinking because it talks about life lessons. And what did I learn today? And I learned you know, by looking at this over the last year or so that it takes, I'm a really slow learner. Because I'm learning the same damn lesson over and over and making the same mistake, you know. and. Uh, and I know it, and I and I know I'm not going to do it today because I wrote it down in my journal, and then and I do the same thing. So, you know, don't bring Hagenas into the house, right? <laughs> <laughs> not a whole pint, anyway. Uh, but but it really is. It's about uh, Bob Dylan uh, put it as he he who's not busy being born is busy dying. And you think about that, it's it's pretty interesting that we're really being reborn. And I don't mean this from a well, maybe I do mean it from a spiritual sense. I don't mean it from a Christian sense of rebirth, but I mean, we are being reborn every day, and every day is a new opportunity, and we can we can tackle the, the old problems that we had and try to do a little bit better with those, whether it's getting along with somebody well or trying something we've never tried before or whatever it is that we keep working at, or we can try new things. And I'm, I'm working now with a lot of people who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s, and it's interesting to see the people that are talking about retiring, and we have a few people here that can talk about that, that that's a, it's really kind of a negative term because it's like retiring. I mean, first of all, why would you tire again? You know, who wants to do that? Uh, but, but also, uh, it's, it's really not the, the end of learning. And, and some of the best uh, activities, I think, are some of these lifelong learning programs that are going on so people don't have to do their job necessarily but can, can continue to learn and that seems to be driving the people that are successful and healthy so uh, what i would like to do is i'd like to get you guys talking but i want to do it this way um could you all the people that are still in school can they come up we're not going to have you talk just talk to each other over here so I want to form a group over here of uh, the young people that are still in school. And over in this other corner, I want uh, people who are parents and that are dealing with, we haven't talked about that side of it. I'd like to hear about that. I have a bit going on with, uh, with Lauren's dad that, uh, that, he, that he will cry at the moment he drops Lauren off to school. And uh, this is the guy that, so we've got a hamburger bit on that, but uh, I see a lot of men who say it doesn't bother me to be going, uh, hit my kid going off to school. But then uh, that last day they fall for the whole month of September when they, they leave that out. So parents come on over here and talk to each other. And then we have a lot of like educators and people who are working in the area of uh, education. And I'd like you to form another group. We're kind of running out of room, but maybe over by the door over here. And uh, we just want to have a little conversation. And if you don't belong to any of those groups, just, just listen in, okay? So uh, I'm sure I'm missing some key ones. I know there's also some people here that are working with college students about that process. So let's just spend five minutes talking about some of the things that we've heard. We need to go join them, Dolly and Karen. <laughs>
with John and Michelle. Come on up. Uh, there's been people in the community uh, for many, many years. <laughs> who have been working on uh, working with this population. And uh, I'd like to uh, give them a chance to talk about what they're doing. So, Michelle, come on up. Uh, Michelle, I'll let you just shout out over the truth. You know how to do it. Hey everybody, my name is Michelle Michele. I do this at Cross Country at Super League, but I never do this place. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I like what, so you do the, the one I like to put. Clap once if you can hear me. <laughs> so I, I, um, I've done pre college advising. I, I've known John and known Rob for a long time. I help students get into college, I help students get out of college. So, as an example, this past month I worked with a, a young lady that's in eighth grade. Um, I meet with families eighth grade through after college. So my, I also met with a young man who was a football player, graduated from Ross, who's exiting college. So eighth grade to exit of college are my people. I had a, a young lady call me one time when she was coughing, and I said, why are you coughing? She said, my mom won't give me cough medicine until I finish my college applications. So this is a very stressful time for families, and I help them through this process. Can you tell us how much money you've helped through Yeah, so this like... Is, um, tell a this is pretty amazing. So, as a parent, my own students have received a lot of scholarship money. Um, they go number two and lots of zeros. So, a woman I met at the Rock School of Business said I should really make this into a business to help more families. So, this year, my class of 2019, which is about a dozen students, they've received $2.5 million in scholarship money. Overall, my students have received six million dollars in scholarship money. So I think I got wonderful schools like the one down the street. <laughs> yeah, my friend John will be there. Yeah, Jeff, what you've been doing for years, and yeah. uh, well, I've known each other for a long time. Looking at the panel here, I my life has has been a part of the panel. I was Sylvia's counselor at Community Eye, where I served for 21 years. Uh, so we had, and her <laughs> brother, which I won't, you know, I won't tell you any of the stories, but we got you through, and then we sent you out to the land of the uh, banana, the slugs, or whatever. Oh, yeah, that's true. The, the slugs and evergreen, and I, and I got to work with Lauren and Ali, and uh, haven't I done a good job? <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were all train wrecks before I met them. <laughs> What a what a great opportunity to spend with kids who are trying to figure out the best fit for college. Uh, with the with the latest scandal and crisis, I was on the radio many times talking about the pressures and the stress and the. But there are some most colleges will take those who want to go. Um, there's only a few, like 50 out of three three thousand five hundred that don't take their first choice students. Um, so kids have many choices to go to college, and I've been privileged to do private work and as well as community high school work uh, with kids and families, helping them find the right fit for college. John, you, you work with my wife, Patricia Pasek, Absolutely. and uh, you might write this book down because it's been out for about 20 years and it's still a great seller called Almost Grown. Love that book. And uh, it's a book uh, written both by Pat and by my son Adam, who today is uh, applying for an uh, interview for a really great job. He's a writer now in, in New York City. And uh, they wrote a book about each perspective on that senior year. It's really start junior year to senior year. And John was uh, very helpful in doing some workshops on that. And how many kids have you helped uh, get it get through this process? It must be thousands. Thousands? Yeah, yeah, thousands. Thousands. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you probably. <laughs> Anybody else out there work with John? <laughs> they might be too old, you know, I think, oh my goodness. Rita, Rita has Rita is? Okay. Okay. okay, great. And then uh, another great resource in our community is Deb and Mary. And maybe, maybe you can talk about what you've been up to, Deb. Well, I can't show. Well, yeah, we have Debbie. Debbie and I have a book as well. So. Oh, you wrote together? Yeah, we wrote together. Oh, yeah. This is our book. Hold it up, John. John. John's usually the one who sells the book because he does it so well. <laughs> So, but the, we wrote this together, solving the college admissions puzzle, and there's three different parts. So, John talks about finding the college that fits you. 
because we all know that the best college is not the same college for everyone. And I wrote about how to write a strong college application essay, which is the part that often gets people really anxious. And then our third author, Jerry Marco, who couldn't be here today because she's celebrating her birthday, which I think is a great reason not to be here, uh, is wrote about scoring well on, on high stakes tests. Um, and for about 14 years, we've been doing a talk at the library called College Night. But what I like to say is I got into this as a parent who didn't know how to help her daughter. I got trained by University of Michigan to understand how they evaluate applications because it's a mystery for all of us. There's a, an article I wrote for the Ann Arbor Observer feature called Papercut on my website, essaycoaching.com. And I uh, work one-on-one -on -one with students in my office on Main Street. I, send, I give them a questionnaire, uh, families are welcome. And what I do that's, I think, different is that I've learned how to show people how to strengthen their writing instead of just saying you need to do this or that. Because I don't know about you, but if somebody tells me to do something, I'm not always likely to do it. I'm a bit of a rebel, and I think that's the teenage personality. So that's the difference. Uh, there is a college fair coming up at Pioneer High School uh, a week from Wednesday. Uh, that's coming up. So thanks for doing this. It's, these kids need all the help they can get. Yeah, I, I don't know if you realize you just just identify yourself as head with a teenage mind, but, uh, <laughs> which is great. But by the way, speaking of a teenage mind, she now has a grandma mind because you had your first grandchild. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so that, that raises a whole other issue of uh, people uh, in Deb's generation and mine about how close you get to your grandkids who are being raised all over the country. So. Uh, it's a whole other dilemma that some of you will be facing soon. If you think your problems are over now, there's more coming <laughs> and opportunities. Well, my tip is that we can all write. We can write to our kids, right? Yeah. So I have pens if anybody wants to. <laughs> <laughs> During Roy G. Bib Water, I love to give out pens. I, I wonder what you had in your bag. It's so much fun. So all right. come and get a pen. Come and get a pen from Dad. And, That's it. and write, write kids' names in the books that you give them. Add the name to the story and they're more likely to read the story. Oh, you mean, you mean the little kids' books or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you just put their name into the, the story okay. with the marker and they yeah. like to read it. Yeah, that's great. Like the, the first time kids learn to read, it's so exciting. Our, our five-year-old granddaughter, Ada, is just about there, you know, so it's exciting to go talk to her about it. Well, thank you very much for everything you've done. And uh, you, you, you're like, uh, you make the show that they do Vanna White. Vanna yeah, exactly. White, yeah. Would you like to buy a bottle? <laughs> How much for a vowel? How much for a vowel? Thank you very much. And we'll be there be selling these books and be having out that information. Uh, and where's our books going to be sold? In? Right up here afterwards. So uh, we've got the iAware book. <clears throat> and I've got two other books. One is called Self Aware, and the other is a journal that helps uh, on self awareness. So you're, you're welcome to take all of those and. Uh, it's, it's very much, thank you very much, Michelle, for all you've done for the community. I remember when I got into uh, Michigan in 1964, and um, I didn't go because I didn't have the money to go. And you know how much it cost for a year? $300. And I, I stayed home my freshman year until I saved enough money to go off because that's how poor we were, you know? And, uh, so it's, it's pretty incredible to find out about the scholarships and give you know, kids who don't normally have the opportunity to go to those schools. And many poor kids don't even think that they can go to schools because they're so expensive. So it gives them a lot of hope. Thank you very much for what you're doing. All right, we're going to take some questions. Um, Kelly, in the back, you, you can address anybody here. We can just address nobody and we can all respond to it. So. A, a quick observation about my uh, self-aware experience going to college, which took me a few years to reflect back on. Um, I started off going to Oakland University, which did not have a huge on-campus presence. Less than 10% of the students lived on campus. I was one of them. So my first experience was it was very diverse compared to Royal Oak, where I had grown up. And then I and and, and there was a lot of uh, age diversity, which again I didn't recognize at that time until I came to U of M. 
And when I transferred to U of M, I realized that I was now surrounded by people literally from all over the world, which was really exciting to me. But everybody was the same age. And, 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 and the longer I sort of pondered that throughout my, my, my college years and beyond, they were two really very, very, very different experiences from a class discussion standpoint and, and otherwise. And it, it took me a while again to kind of understand how valuable having people of many ages yeah. uh, were in, in, in my classroom. So okay. Well, I, I'm going to let Sylvia talk about that because she's big on thinking about diversity in some different ways, too. And maybe you could share some of your thoughts about that. Thanks, Rob. I do care a lot about diversity. I, I think that our, as entrepreneurs especially, our workplaces are stronger when they're diverse and are not only stronger based on having good ideas and reaching out to more communities, but also um, our bottom lines are stronger. And one of the things I think we're missing in the conversations about diversity is self-awareness about the culture, the unspoken culture in our workplaces and whether or not it's welcoming or whether or not it's a barrier to new talent and diverse talent joining our workplaces. Often, the way that we interact at work is um, like a, a set, like a code. And a lot of people grow up knowing what the code is so they know how to behave in the workplace. And if we don't educate people about what that code is or if we don't expand the code about how to dress and where to sit and who to talk to and how to um, tattle without looking like you're tattling and all those little workplace behaviors, then we end up only being able to hire people that already seem comfortable in our workplace and those are people that have already grown up in privilege which means that our workplaces become more homogenous and um, less talented because we already know what we all think and that means we're missing some serious opportunities um, so what did you guys learn in your group what did you hear from other students um, from other students, uh, you guys can talk if you want, but we really, they talked a lot about, I want to get into this school, what if I don't get in? What if I don't get in here and I really want to? And we kind of talked about there are two constants when you're applying to colleges. You have your GPA, you have your ACT slash SAT. Those are things that you can't change even unless you take the SAT again, of course. But when you're applying, you can't change that whatsoever, so you shouldn't be stressed about it. If your GPA is great and that's a benefit, perfect. But if it's something that you think is holding you back, then in your essays, you should put more time into those to enhance them. But you should never stress out about something that you can't change. So I think that that's mostly what you guys were stressed about when you're talking. And that's basically it. Uh, same thing, uh, where to apply and what happens if you don't get in. Uh, like I said before, I recommend two reach schools to target schools. So target schools are like, you'll think you'll get into them and you'll be happy there. And reach schools would be well, on the lower chance that you'll get in, but they're still very great schools. And then two state schools. So if you don't get in, it's, it's, it's important to know that you're gonna, the college is not gonna shape you you're more so than you are gonna shape the college experience. So that's important to realize that as well. All right, can you talk about kids that don't feel like they fit when they get in, you get in. Small schools, big schools, how do you feel? Uh, I think that a big part of the, the transition to college is recognizing that everyone else is transitioning to college as well. And so that experience of imposter syndrome, raise your hand if you've heard of imposter syndrome. So that's that feeling that uh, you got in because it was a fluke and that you're actually a fraud and that uh, once they discover you, they're going to kick you out because you don't belong there. That is a universal feeling. You know, that is something that comes up for most people. And uh, going into college, by definition, you're going to have much fewer connections than, than you had in high school. You're going to be potentially away from your family. You're not going to have your close friends with you. And everyone else is in the same boat. And so uh, that feeling of I don't fit in and I'm the only one feeling lonely, uh, it's important to expect that, to recognize that, and then move through that. And, and, and think about uh, everyone on my hall, everyone sitting next to me in class, we're all trying to, to navigate 
uh, finding new friendships, finding meaning, uh, figuring out career. And so those are things to, to connect over. So I think for people that are struggling to, to fit in, uh, acknowledging that um, everyone is, gonna, is going to appreciate it if you say, hey, do you want to um, go get lunch? Or do you want to have a study group? And so kind of getting over that, that initial awkwardness of, oh, this is new and unfamiliar, and recognizing that you know, anytime you reach out to someone, they're gonna appreciate that. So I think that, that goes a long way in addressing those, those very normal, human, natural feelings of, of being overwhelmed by a brand new situation. So bond over that and connect over that, I think that can make a big difference. I remember reading, uh, I went to Ferndale High School, Kelly was a royal oak, I think we were rivals, Kelly, but uh, that the, um, I read a book in this, my senior year of high school called How to Win Friends and Influence People. How many have read that book? That's one of the greatest books of all time. I mean, it really changed my personality. And essentially it said, show your interest in other people. And it, it didn't say, you know, do this or, but it said just ask good questions and, and, and show that you're curious. And, you know, people say, oh, we don't get a nice personality. Well, that's, that was a turning point. And I didn't know what to say, like, well, how's the weather, you know, or uh, whatever. But uh, this, this, really, this book really gets at the core. I think it's a lot of great learning in it. And uh, I think yeah, it is a great opportunity to, to recognize this car and say that when you're going out there that you're not the only one and that if you just talk to people they'll open up about their experiences and it's it's good to learn to ask you know for what you want uh, i think today kids are a little bit more emboldened about asking i was very very shy about doing those and i, I can see where i missed the opportunity i also have a couple of people in the audience that uh, want to do an ask and they're they're at a different stage which is about work and so uh now you can come up and uh now I'm gonna just met uh, a while ago, but you're looking for work, and I think there's some people out there that might be able to help you. So can you say what it is that you're doing? Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Donovan. I just moved in from Philadelphia yesterday. And... <laughs> and um, He's a pretty shy guy, so... <laughs> and I've worked with Sylvia um, uh, at summer camps for many, many years and I'm looking to uh, have an entry role in tech. So if anyone knows any um, rules for, uh, for work with children or autism or tech, uh, I'm your, your person, so. How many guys out there, uh, women are in the tech world? A lot. Raise your hands high there. Okay, so Hans is not in the tech world. Oh, come on. Yeah, so everybody's in the tech world. So you're looking for an introduction. You're not like a programmer, but you want to learn how to do this. Uh, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Wait, Rob, can I endorse yeah. that? So guys, you know I've come to this a couple of times, and I don't bring a lot of people here, um, but Donovan is like, I mean, it's hard to say this about yourself, so I'm going to say it for him, but he is extremely talented. He's like one of the fastest learners I've ever met and his human skills are so excellent. He can connect on any team, and he's got this like, have you ever met people that just like, everybody remembers who they are, even if they only met them for a second because they have that kind of shining personality? That is Donovan, and he's been so loyal to our, our my businesses that I just wanna like pay it forward for him and let other people benefit from his intelligence and loyalty in their company. I'm signing you up right now. <laughs> uh, other questions from the audience? Yes. So, question it's around... Right, you stand up? Oh, I guess. Six, five of you right here, yeah. Uh, around, like, Facebook and the fact that Facebook is only showing the positive and people in the best light, how does that play out from young know, high schoolers or the folks that you work with? You know, is that, does that impact your thoughts? Yeah, so in our book, we actually talk about fear of missing out, which is FOMO, and we interviewed... It's Laura, that's a cool word. FOMO. FOMO, I never knew it before. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> so, when I, so um, when interviewing the college students, a lot of them talked to us about, they felt like they had to go to every single event, and if they weren't there, then they were just missing out, and it made them feel stressed out, and it gave them anxiety, even though maybe they were doing something productive, they were working on homework in the meantime. And I think that I experience this a lot. Um, if I like feel sick and I don't want to go to a football game, I feel like, oh, I need to go, because all my friends are going to be there, and I just need to go. 
and I think that really social media, um, we use Instagram mostly, but it's just, um, I'm, myself. I'm sorry, it's just really the highlights of everyone's life, nobody's ever going to post anything where they're sad, so it really does make me feel stressed out. Yeah, so this social media grows in importance on teenagers. Uh, it's going to be, the fear of missing out is just going to get way worse. Um, but what I found to help me with that was the journal that uh, Rob has for uh, guiding success and work in life, which is out there on the bench as well. I don't know if it'll be out here uh, later. Yeah. So that journal helped me prioritize or list my priorities, so I was able to keep a good mindset on what I wanted to do. So I evaded going to, so if I saw friends hanging out, I, I realized that I had to focus on my priorities. If I had a uh, academic thing I need to take care of, I put that ahead of going to a party that night or whatever. So I helped, I thought the journal helped me a lot. So listing priorities and keeping the right mindset helped me with home. Any other questions? <coughs> yes, my um, friend. Could you stand up please to say who you are? And Hi, I'm Cassie. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, um, with, you know, I think it was Karen uh, mentioned like, you know, 3,000 choices in colleges around and that, that kind of thing. Um, how, how is it that you were able to narrow down your choices to find your six, your, you know, your six schools that you apply to? Um, uh, so, this is, everybody's going to do it differently, but for me, for sure what you did as well, but for me what made it easiest was I, um, I looked at what I wanted to do. So first step was the career I wanted to go in. So I realized I wanted to go into a business, let's say, but that, that'll eventually change. Um, I mean, I think it's like 75% of college students, maybe more end up changing their majors, but I looked at business and I said, okay, what are the top schools in business that I feel I would thrive in and would help me that have a lot of resources that are abundant? So I found a few schools to offer me that opportunity. So I went out and visited them, made sure, made sure I wanted to apply to those schools ended up liking them, so I applied. So I think looking at the career will help you determine what college you want to apply to. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit um, in the group right here. We talked about um, where do you apply to college and how do you know like which colleges are the best fit for you. And again, I go back to GPA and SAT. A lot of people think that they just need to apply to the top colleges no matter what. But whatever range that you're in, and usually it's like a line, like everyone has the same, like if their GPA is high, their ACT is high, and vice versa. And then you have that group of schools that you can look at. And for me, I kind of chose a little bit differently, like geographically. So I said, I wouldn't go west of Texas, and I wouldn't go far south. So I just kind of looked at schools in the area that were good in engineering, and I also, I looked for a lot of social aspects in schools as well because I wanted to go to a bigger school. So I think that that narrowed down my choices as well. And I applied to 10 schools. Could you talk about how the feel of the school made a difference to you? Yeah, for sure. So um, a big thing for me when choosing a school was the feel. So I got into a lot of schools and whenever I went and visited them, I just didn't feel like I could picture myself there and I would be happy there and I would thrive there. Um, I went to the University of Kentucky twice, and the first time I visited was before I got in, and I told my mom, I, I could definitely go here, I could see myself here. And I did that at a lot of other schools as well, but the second time that I visited, after already being an admitted student, I felt that I felt like I was at home on the campus, and I knew that I could thrive in different ways. And that's not to say that other schools probably wouldn't have provided me with the same, it's just to say that that's where I felt comfortable. And everyone's going to feel comfortable at a different school. But um, I think in the book, Johnny, who was one of the students that we interviewed, he said that that's how he felt when he went to the University of Michigan. There were other schools that he got into that probably would have been a good fit. But every time he came back, he just felt like this was the school that was meant for him. I remember uh, my son Adam I was trying to figure out where to go to school. He was in Wisconsin, and he got into Michigan, and Michigan State, and uh, a couple other places. And uh, he went to Wisconsin, and it was like uh, March, you know, and, uh, but it was one of those March days that got to like 65, and the sun was out, 
and the girls were wearing, you know, bathing suits already on the deck there. Uh, you know, it was like, it was all over, right? So that meant he was going to go to Wisconsin, and if we had gone there on a day like today, and not only that, but then, he was a, we have a bunch of kids at our block uh, in, in Ann Arbor, so uh, his younger brother and our next door neighbor went to Wisconsin, because they hadn't been going to Wisconsin. And then, um, well, that was the other thing. When he went that weekend, his older friend, uh, was one of the guys, oh, it's um, White, what's his name? Uh, uh, Whitefoot. Uh, Crowfoot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wade Crowfoot had gone here. Wade was a couple years older. He knew him from camp. He invited him to a party. So a party Sunday night, Monday, beautiful sunshine. That was it. You know, he was set at Wisconsin. It didn't matter where else he got in. And then, uh, Dan and his next door neighbor went, and then the girls across the street decided they'd go to Wisconsin too, because so like a whole Powell Street went to Wisconsin. How did that happen? Because it was sunny day in March. That's, the, that's the whole thing right there. Other questions? Yes, right in front here. Go ahead. Just shout it out. Um, I was wondering what you thought about, especially if you don't know what you're interested in yet, or like. Is it better to just try and take college and go right away or maybe take a gap year and figure it out or start college and then figure it out? Well, I think the key, she asked them, is it, is it a good idea to take a gap year or go straight through and, you know, how to figure it out? And I think, um, I don't think that there's a recipe for figuring it out. I wish that there was, because I would love to just tell you this is exactly what you should do and it will work out perfectly. But there isn't that. There's not a perfect rubric. I think I don't think that taking a gap year is a bad idea at all. I think that if you take a gap year and spend the whole time scrolling Instagram and feeling awful about your life, then it's a bad idea. If you take a gap year and you do something you care about and or you learn something about working, then great. If I think if you go to school and you spend the whole year scrolling Instagram and feeling terrible about yourself, then that's a bad idea. <laughs> and that, I guess I think that in that you, the school you go to actually like can define your life, but it doesn't um, it doesn't make or break the success of your life. So because actually you define your life and that you can build a life you want from almost any school you go to. So I don't think that, although it seems like you're risking like one identity versus another identity for your whole life, I actually think that you're gonna build the life you like from wherever you are and that you get to keep doing that. So if you build a life that you then outgrow by the end of school, you can build another one. And you can build another one at 30 and you can build another one at 50. So it isn't the last or the biggest decision that you ever make. It might be one of the first big ones, but it doesn't, um, like where you end up on it actually doesn't turn out to matter as much as it seems like it does. No one has ever cared about where I went to school for the most part. In fact, I could be lying about it and no one would know. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I want to touch on the career. Um, so when, when you come down to choosing a career at iHealth, what helped me was minus all the money and all the financial aspects, what would you genuinely, genuinely enjoy doing each day of your life? What would you, what would you love waking up and going to work? I mean, no, I don't think anybody's gonna love going to work. What would you enjoy doing at work? Taking away all the financial aspects and then I'm, uh, reaching that decision will also help us uh, looking at what your good and what your strengths are and what job will help you utilize those strengths? Um, for me, I think what helped the most is just job shadowing. So really finding every single profession that, hey, I may be interested in that and asking those people, hey, can I shadow you for a day and seeing what they do. Um, I think that would be really beneficial. Also just taking random opportunities. When me and Ali chose or invited to do an internship with Rob. We started by scanning papers every single day for hours to make his class online. And 
that just kind of goes to show what taking random opportunities can lead up to because now we have a book. So. <laughs> that was kind of interesting because they said internship. I thought, okay, well, I, I don't know, what do I do for an intern? I, I work pretty much by myself. And then after a, a week of scanning, I thought, this is not a good experience. <laughs> so I said, well, you guys have to try to take a crack at rewriting a book that I had written for college students, for high school students, and they were both on it and ran with it. I hardly had to give them any guidance because it just flowed. And thanks to Beth, too, who took a big guiding hand, Beth Humphreys, on that. But, uh, you know, I think you could sometimes create great things by accident. Uh, I remember when I graduated from Michigan, uh, the biggest thing I was worried about was not a career, but about the, the, the Vietnam War, which was raging, raging in 1968. And I really didn't want to go fight in that war, which I was not so much believing in. And uh, I ended up having an opportunity to go work in New York City schools as a, as a what they call an above quota substitute. And that meant that I was in a school and I was subbing every day in that school, so every day, I always had somebody that was out. And that led to me working in a project with a group of kids that were African Americans on an African American heritage project, which then led to being on TV and doing plays, which stuff I had never done. And when I applied to Harvard, which was a reach school for me for graduate school, uh, that's the only school I got into. It's interesting. I didn't get into my for sure schools. Because Harvard really wanted people that had great experiences. They didn't want the, I had like a 3.4 average, you know, at Michigan, which was good, but it wasn't a 4 point. But they were looking for students that had been socially active and had done cool things. So that experience that I never could have planned led me to go to Harvard. And uh, then, it, as you said, the imposter syndrome set in and I didn't get past my fear for four years and by then I had graduated. So, you know, that's what happens. I think, uh, Assuming everybody else in those top schools belong there, and it was a mistake that I got in. That's, I think, how most of us felt. So I think that, you know, this, this kind of idea of the random walk of life, but you got to be open to learning from it. I think that's the key. And you mentioned uh, the, 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 the sort of the sweet spot, Ali. I think if you think about these four things, it, it really helps. And that is, uh, what am I passionate about? So, you know, if you think about it, you take a gap here. What are you passionate about? Let me just ask you, is there something that you really care about? Um, art. art, okay. Any particular, like sculpture or just general art? And... Huh, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. All right, so then the second circle is, what are you really good at? You know, what is your strengths, you might say? But, you know, we all say, well, we're not this is good. But there's something that you're better at than most people. You know, so is there something like that you think you've got talent beyond the average? Painting, okay, so you love art and you're really, really good at painting. And then the other, the next circle of what I call is the uh, lifestyle values. And by lifestyle values, it's like, well, do you want to work 80 hours, you know, or do you want to go to a place like Michigan for graduate school where you had an opportunity to go into engineering where you're competing with the brightest kids from around the world kids that are coming from Korea and China and never got anything except work all day long. And you're going to be competing with those kids. Maybe that's not the lifestyle you want, where you're in Kentucky, you're a little with kids that are maybe a little bit more uh, into uh, you know, life of enjoying things and not just working hard. Another thing might be you want a big city life or you want uh, a small town, you know? And somebody mentioned they're going to NYU. Who's there? person still here that's going to go to NYU. Okay, I think I heard somebody, but they want the big city life. Other people, yeah, the big city life is like, oh my God, I am not, I cannot imagine myself living in Brooklyn or Manhattan. I want to go to a school like Canyon, which is a, you know, there's 5,000 people in, in the city. And then the last piece is money. And that's the reality, as Michelle has talked about scholarship. What can I afford? And, uh, you know, I would not apply to a school because you don't think you can afford it because sometimes those schools want you more than you might want them and they want uh, to give you money to come to their schools. So a lot of kids that the money piece will, will deter them from coming, but it shouldn't. So if you put those four things together, you love art, you're great at painting, uh, lifestyle, big city, small city? Big city. Big city, okay. Uh, you know, so maybe you should really look at what are the top art schools in the big cities. And there's 
probably 20 big cities in the country. It doesn't have to be New York. And if you want to take a gap here, can you get a job somewhere, you know, working in an art supply store or on the campus of uh, what is the Pratt Institute in New York, you know, where you, you work there and you learn about uh, the, the world, you get acquainted with the people. So that's the kind of thinking that I try to get people to do. And this is not just for students, but it's for career change too, because I work with people that are in the 40s, 50s, and 60s who are trying to figure out what are you doing. I mean, you were doing something before you started your tech. What were you doing last? Um, well, I... Come on up for me. <laughs> Put you on the spot here. So you're, you're starting a new venture. What are you moving I from? was just thinking of a perfect example of someone who keeps starting over, um, but not in a way that deserves any disrespect. I don't think I was an English major at the University of Michigan and a Russian minor, and I absolutely loved it. And if you grow up around here, people will tell you you should go, right? Because if you stay, it looks like you failed to launch. But um, I traveled with my husband a fair amount in his tech work to Silicon Valley and New York, and there's some great communities out there with a lot to offer, but we always felt like there's something holding us here that's not just family roots. Um, so we stayed. So I have been everything from a book editor to a parenting blogger to the copy chief for a car magazine to, it, it's kind of media, right? But I worked in media research for a PR firm and marketing for a year, um, always trying to aim toward editorial. And um, I would like to encourage you just personally that, um, or anybody here, that if you're not sure, especially if you're in the arts, because there's less of a direct life path and less of a a guidance system for that, it does help to connect with a lot of people who've been there before and can, can give you some advice. But um, I really actually resonate with what Lauren's saying about getting the feel of a place because I think we tend to discredit ourselves and our feelings when we're looking into career choices because we need to be grounded and practical. But um, you, you actually know a lot more than you think you do about what you care about, about what means something to you, and about what you connect with. And I wouldn't discount that because um, that's what keeps bringing me back to Ann Arbor, and that's what keeps bringing me back to media jobs, and I wouldn't change it. I mean, media is in a lot of trouble right now, and I'm still here, and there are still ways to, to make it a success. Fantastic, fantastic, good answer. Uh, and I think you can see in the kind of journey, you know, it's not, it's not one place that you go, but it's, it's, it's a lifelong journey. And that's where I think the journaling, as Ali mentioned, is fun. And so I'd like to ask you to do a little journaling right now. And each of you is, um, what, one first thing I ask is, what's a key lesson you're walking away from? So just jot down, if you have a notebook, I see you've got a moleskin in there, that's cool, I use those. So, or if you've got a phone, it's a little bit, you write. But what's one key life learning lesson for you? So not just about, I learned about that, but what did I learn about myself today. So just take a minute and jot that down and then share it with your neighbor, okay? As a, as a text or email, it's uh, my my text is uh, it's rpasic at gmail.com, probably the easiest. And also, if you got photos, we're going to uh, usually we put the video up uh, in the week or so afterwards, and we we'll put some of these comments up. But share with us what you learned because it, I think this is a process that uh, is great for sharing. I love the fact that John and Debbie and uh, who else you said is. Uh, so, okay, so wrote the, Jerry Markle wrote the book, 
a collaborative kind of work, and it's really very enjoyable to do that. So who would like to go first about something you learned today that you didn't expect to learn? Take it away. Um, so I came in here already kind of knowing that I most likely would end up leaning towards U of M over playing soccer at Case Western. Um, but I think this really like solidified that if I do end up going to Case Western, I'm going to be more of an athlete than a student. So, uh, and I want to be able to balance it out really. So that was just something I learned today. You made your mom happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only child stays home, yes. <laughs> I, I kind of forgot about how much anxiety there is around those early big life decisions. And, um, but I also know so many adults that still have them. So I, I guess I'm learning that it's very human to keep being worried about being in the right place. Uh, I was reminded uh, about the importance of social media for this generation. This is a generation entering college that has grown up with this, which is really different from my experience. Uh, and that comes up quite a bit in my practice as well. So um, recognizing the influence of that and kind of uh, the importance of de developing, um, there's this idea of like digital hygiene. So just like self-care for our bodies and for our health, having uh, healthy habits around social media can be really helpful. Um, and kind of along those lines, I brought a handout with, a, with some uh, other tips for adjusting to college and making that transition. Uh, and I'm also offering um, yoga workshops here in town um, that are uh, focused on yoga for anxiety and depression. So teaching the skills of self-care and coping uh, and all, all ages are welcome. So feel free to ask me more about that. I think that I was kind of reminded to the place that I where it was last year before I started this internship with Rob and how stressed I was. And I just wanted to like let all the juniors know in this room that it's okay to be feeling this way and it's completely normal. And I think that definitely taking the self-awareness approach will definitely help you choose in college. Well, I've we learned a lot. I'm impressed with, with all these young people that I, I've uh, worked with over the years and, and to see uh, the professionalism that's here and uh, also the great turnout, the great support from uh, Ann Arbor schools and Saline schools. I'm just really impressed how many people have come and I'm welcome to our community here of, of leadership. So uh, I, I appreciate everybody coming. I also wanted to just, Manal, can we come up just for a minute? I didn't want Manal, uh, who is uh, also known as Ali's mom, to uh, upstage. When you have a pretty important role in terms of this, can you maybe talk about your role as a psychiatrist and what, what you're doing uh, at a national level about this? Um, so, um, the, yes, yeah, so I'm Benal Asi. I, it's very interesting because when you become pregnant and you have a child, you stop existing as yourself. You become somebody's mom. <laughs> um, and it was sort of a, a really sort of poignant reminder to me because when he was like eight years old, it was Mother's Day and he got me a gift. And he said, Happy Mother's Day and all. And he said, Now let's go to GameStop. I was like, Why are we going to GameStop? And he said, Well, I want to get a game. I said, This is my day. It's supposed to be about me. And he said, Think about it. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be a mother. <laughs> and it was such a strong message. And argument, I had to take him to GameStop. <laughs> I think sort of I'm holding like two hats like on the one hand I'm a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist in town and so I work with a lot of teenagers and young adults sort of transitioning through college um, but I'm also like I have to put that hat aside and be his mom and so this process of doing this on two parallel levels has been very interesting for me um, but one of my involvement separate from that is at the national level um, with the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And I work on a committee with the, um, known as ACAP. Um, and that committee puts out a lot of resources for families. So if you're ever interested in some of the resources on all mental illness, all sort of learning issues, transition to college and beyond, you go to acap.org and you look at the resource centers. And everything you want to learn about depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, um, the Transitional Age Youth Committee, we put out a lot of information for families that are easy to read. Um, and that information is really sort of like get, pooling a lot of resources together 
and it's free and it's available and you can print out the handouts and press them on. Um, so, could you say it again? So, aacap.org um, and go on resource centers and facts for families. Your email will be that, and I'll, I'll put on the post about this uh, and the books that have been mentioned and anything else that people want to share because uh, there's a lot of cool things going on in the community. And again, I want to, you know, as a psychiatrist, and I'm a psychologist by training, did family and childhood for years. Uh, and I remember when I was in college, a book came out about the crisis in child mental health uh, in, the, in the early 70s. And I think it's, it's gotten worse, unfortunately. Nothing much has happened. So again, we, we sit among, uh, most of us, in a fairly privileged situation. I know that word's got kind of a buzz to it right now. But I think it's also important to really uh, think about ways that we can reach out to kids that don't think they have this opportunity to go to college, supporting things like community college, but also uh, mentoring, tutoring, bringing those kids into your workplace uh, would be very, very different. Because I find there's a huge gap. Uh, I teach a class at the Ross School, and I've got um, Ross School kids who tend to be quite privileged. <clears throat> I know they try to give out some scholarships, but uh, I would say the median income of their parents is well over $200,000 a year. And then I have some football players in the class, and many of those come from really impoverished backgrounds. And those kids, despite all their fame and uh, notoriety on campus, really are intimidated by college. And they want to hang together, they don't want to uh, hang out with other kids, not because they're stuck up, but because they're afraid and they're among also a minority, a lot of them are African American, and there's not many African American kids in, in Raw. So those, those differences persist, and I think, uh, you know, we all are in leadership roles, and I think we need to take a stand about those and uh, get on our own soapbox box to try to make some differences in our communities. So with that, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. We're going to sign some books if people want to come up and purchase them, uh, and if you, uh, want to hang out we have the room to 10 o'clock so hopefully more community uh, we can also if you want uh, try to send out some names of people if you have other resources you want to let us know about we'll be happy to post that so thank you all for coming thank you Beth for uh, helping get all this organized and uh, I think all of you should remember what Manal said and remember why you're a parent, right? Thank your kids today for being here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mother's Day.